They cleared the mutant proteins we were interested in, like mutant Huntington, and mediated protector, protection in cell Drosophila and zebrafish models of Huntington's disease. These include a whole series of L-type calcium channel antagonists, um, drugs that in, uh, inhibit calpanes, and also drugs that agonize imidazine receptors, like clonidine and rulminidine. I'd like to focus on these because the rulminidine has been a focus of a, a follow-up study that I'll discuss with you just now. This drug activates these imidazine receptors to decrease cyclic AMP levels, and um, we showed that by decreasing cyclic AMP, one induces autophagy. Conversely, if one activates cyclic AMP, one blocks autophagy. And the species of cyclic AMP that does this is a species that activates a guanine-nucleotide exchange factor called EPAC, that activates um, the small G protein, RAP2B, that we showed activates phospholipase C epsilon. And you'll note that phospholipase C epsilon produces our old friend IP3 of our slide before. Um, so we followed up the rulminidine um, in mouse studies, uh, it was our top candidate for follow-up in mice, because it's a drug that's essentially acting antihypertensive. So it reduces blood pressure by acting on receptors in the brain, not peripherally. And the critical point here is that it acts on the same target for reducing blood pressure as it does to induce autophagy. As you all know, if you're going to take um, blood pressure uh, medication, it's got to be a drug that you can take chronically for decades. And indeed, this drug is very safe and is well tolerated. So people taking the conventional dose of this drug have as many side effects as people taking placebo. Um, critically, the receptors are widely expressed in the brain. So they're expressed in all the right regions for Huntington's disease, Alzheimer's disease, etc. We showed, as we would have expected, that this drug induces autophagy in the primary striatal neurons, reduces mutant hunting levels in the mouse model of Huntington's disease, and alleviates signs in the disease to a similar extent to what we saw with rapamycin. And so the next stage we're taking here is a safety trial of this drug in Huntington's patients um, in collaboration with Roger Barker in Cambridge. And the reason we're doing this is just to ensure there are no unforeseen drug gene interactions with the Huntington's mutation that might cause some type of toxicity. And hopefully we, that will uh, not be the case, and then we'll be able to proceed to a suitably powered proof of concept study. So the first conclusion I'd like to leave you with is that enhancing autophagy um, reduces the levels of a wide range of different intracytoplasmic aggregate prone proteins that cause neurodegenerative diseases. This reduces, I, I haven't shown, but we've also shown that inducing autophagy reduces susceptibility to proapatotic insults and caspase activation, which is likely to be an additional protective mechanism in these type of neurodegenerative diseases. Um, we've shown proof of principle for this in animal models of Huntington's disease and a range of related conditions. Um, and shown that this can be affected through drugs that activate autophagy through the target of rapamycin or through mTOR-independent mechanisms. I'd like to end off by describing what happens when autophagy is blocked and showing why this might be relevant to neurodegenerative diseases. This idea was in introduced by two Japanese groups, Masaki Komatsu and Noboru Mizushima, who inactivated autophagy genes to different autophagy genes in mouse neurons um, conditionally and showed the same phenotypes. So they showed the uh, accumulation of these ubiquitinated aggregates in a range of neuronal populations, a loss of neuronal cells. So this is the Purkinje layer of the cerebellum in wild type mice, and you can see there's a loss of cells in the autophagy in null mice. And this is associated with increased tunnel staining, which is a marker of apoptosis suggesting that it's cell death that is reducing the cell numbers. These two cardinal features were accompanied by the accumulation of a protein called P62, which is a ubiquitin binding protein that I'll discuss just now. And interestingly, they showed that the P62 immunoreactivity almost perfectly co-localized with the ubiquitin immunoreactivity, and that I'll discuss because it represents a clue to mechanism. These were not Hocane experiments. We and others have shown that autophagy compromises a feature of many different neurodegenerative diseases. So for instance, um, Ashley Winslow in the lab studied what happened when you have too much alpha-synuclein in a cell or in a mouse. 
Alpha-synuclein is the key component of the aggregates you see in Parkinson's disease. And accumulation of alpha-synuclein is sufficient to give you Parkinson's disease because they're patients who have this disease who have a duplication of the alpha-synuclein gene that gives you a dose effect. She showed that Parkinson's disease, or alpha excess alpha-synuclein blocked autophagosome formation and um, could account for increased aggregation in this condition. In collaboration with Owen Neff's group, we showed that this degenerative epilepsy also is associated with a block in autophagosome formation by <coughs> acting through a different mechanism through the Parkinson's disease scenario. I mentioned to you earlier that in order for autophagosomes to have their contents degraded, they've got to be trafficked to the region of the cells where the lysosomes reside. And we showed that this is blocked by diamond mutations um, and it's worth pointing out that this machinery is mutated in forms of motor neuron diseases that give you um, aggregates in the cells. So it provides a very plausible explanation for that phenomenon. Finally, one can get a problem in autophagy when the lysomes aren't functioning properly. So in collaboration with Andrea Balabio's group, we showed that in lysomal storage disease, there's a general block in autophagosome lysome fusion. Recently, Randy Nixon's group have showed a similar phenomenon due to presenilin 1 mutations that give you forms of Alzheimer's disease, and Anne Simonson's and others have shown that mutations in the escort complex that give you forms of frontotemporal dementia also give a similar phenomenon. Finally, Anna Maria Cuervo's group have shown that there might be deficits or partial defects in cargo loading into autophagosomes mediated by the Huntington's mutation. It's worth pointing out that in these types of diseases where we've looked, one sees a very similar phenomenon as one noted in the autophagy now mice. So the brown staining here shows ubiquitinative inclusions that accumulate in the lysomal storage disease model brain compared to the wild type. These are maybe easier to see with the fluorescent staining here. Um, the ubiquitin also accumulates in soluble forms, as you can see on the western blot. Um, one also sees the accumulation of this protein P62 in the lysomal storage disease mice, and the P62 staining is co-registering with the ubiquitin staining. We were intrigued. Why are we accumulating ubiquitinated proteins when you're blocking autophagy? After all, the key alternative proteolytic system in the cell is the ubiquitin proteasome system, which recognizes proteins when they're ubiquitinated, and the ubiquitination serves as a signal for degradation. So we thought, well, is autophagy compromising the ubiquitin proteasome system? The dogma in the literature was no, but we decided to test this. So what we found was that, in fact, autophagy does co partially compromise flux for the ubiquitin proteasome system. So this is a cartoon of autophagy degrading P62 in the lysosomes. This is the ubiquitin proteasome system. Here's a ribosome making a new protein, which gets ubiquitinated by a series of enzymes. The ubiquitin is a, a small protein, it's this red dot. And this series of enzymes forms a ladder of ubiquitins. <coughs> so you have four or more ubiquitins attached to the protein, and this serves as a recognition signal for delivery to the proteasome when the protein is then degraded. One of the key players in mediating the delivery of the protein to the proteasome after it's ubiquitinated is a ubiquitinating, a ubiquitinating binding protein called P97. And we focused on P97 because it's mutated in some diseases where you see aggregates and neurodegeneration. So this is what Victor Karolchuk found. When you block autophagy, you accumulate P62. That was not unexpected. But P62, because it's a ubiquitin binding protein, competes with proteins like P97 for binding ubiquitinated proteins and actually stops them getting to the proteasome where they need to be degraded. This has two consequences. First, one decreases flux through the ubiquitin proteasome system, and because this pathway degrades critical short-lived proteins in the cell, which are key regulators like P53, these proteins accumulate quite rapidly to higher levels, both in cell-based systems and in vivo. So P53 accumulates to levels which would be expected to enhance toxicity and apoptosis. Secondly, the P62 is a protein that tends to oligomerize. And we believe that the P62 is forming the seed for the inclusions because it's forming these oligomers. And the reason the inclusions are ubiquitinated is because the P62 is a ubiquitin binding protein. So 
So far, I've described what happens with genetic lesions which give you neurodegenerative disease. And the final slide just shows that this can occur with environmental insults that occur in neurodegeneration, in neurodegeneration as well. So Sovan Sarkar in the lab showed that nitric oxide accumulation blocks autophagy. And it does this through mTOR, and mTOR, mTOR dependent and mTOR independent pathways. And in the question time, I can describe the mechanisms and the proteins that are nitrosylated. But suffice it to say that nitric oxide accumulation, which is a hallmark of many neurodegenerative diseases, blocks autophagy and slows the clearance of autophagy substrates and therefore would be expected to cause more, more protein aggregation. Conversely, if one takes disease models and one treats them with an agent that blocks nitric oxide formation, one can induce autophagy and reduce the aggregates. So we showed this in cell-based systems, in, in, in Drosophila, both with, G, uh, with, with, with drugs and with genetic manipulation. But I thought I'd show you the zebrafish data, which is actually quite striking. So this is a zebrafish model we made, which expresses mutant Huntington in the rod photoreceptors. So you can see the mutant Huntington aggregating um, in, the, in, in, the, in the zebrafish retina. And when we treat with rapamycin, the number of aggregates go down. And if one treats with a drug that blocks nitric oxide formation, the number of aggregates go down as well. This is autophagy dependence. So if you poison the lysosomes with ammonium chloride, one gets an increase in the number of aggregates. And in ammonium chloride treated cells, the drug that decreases nitric oxide formation has no effect, suggesting that it's an autophagy dependent effect of the nitric oxide reduction on autophagy reduction, uh, on, on clearance of these aggregates. So I'd like you to be left with a few key messages. The first is that autophagy induction might be a protective strategy we can use in a number of neurodegenerative diseases. It has relevance not only to Huntington's disease, but to a range of neurodegenerative conditions. And we've shown proof of principle in uh, many of these diseases in cells, in flies, in zebrafish, and in mice. And indeed, some others now have replicated our findings in other diseases in mice. Um, and this can be mediated by drugs acting both on the target of rapamycin and drugs that are working through independent pathways that might be much safer. On the other hand, autophagy compromise might be an important feature that contributes to a range of neurodegenerative conditions with enhanced protein aggregation and susceptibility to apoptosis. And some of these effects might be mediated through a knock-on effect where autophagy compromise actually leads to a decrease in flux through ubiquitin proteasome system. Finally, I'd like to just acknowledge that this work has been done over a fairly long period of time by many people in my lab. I mentioned some of the key people by name as I've gone along, so I'd just like to focus on our collaborators. Um, we've had a long-standing collaboration with Steve Brown at Harwell, who um, contributed to the Dynan studies in the mice that I discussed earlier. Um, Kahiro Kane in Cambridge, being our partner in crime for many years with all the Drosophila studies we've done. Um, Olaf Ries gave us the Spinocerebellar of NA taxi type 3 mice before they were published. Um, we generated a zebrafish model with a small biotech company that used to be in Cambridge, and Paul Cudnell's a university postdoc in my group that did it while he was seconded there. Elizabeth storage disease studies were done in collaboration with Andrea Balabio uh, in Naples, and of course, we couldn't have done this work without the generous funding we've had over many years. Thank you very much. Questions? Very, very nice talk. A couple of questions. Um, one is that some of the uh, neurodegenerative disease therapy research has focused on actually disrupting the formation of the aggregates. And so the question there is, are the, is, are the aggregates more or less toxic than the uh, malfolded proteins that make them up? The second thing is, um, is compromise with aging of autophagy the reason for the increased incidence with age of essentially all the neurodegenerative diseases? So I think the first question is the important question. Um, I think it's a question that's led to black and white answers where actually the situation is much more complex than it ought to be. So, um, and actually Huntington's disease is a culprit disease in that scenario. Um, so if, if people don't mind, I think it's worth addressing that issue. 
um, in Huntington's disease, cell-based systems, it looked like that the cells that formed the aggregates lived actually longer than the cells that didn't have the big aggregates. But the trouble is in the cell-based system, most of the aggregates were forming in the nucleus.